Okay, it's Monday, and that's Steve Holmes, and I'm Jay Fidel, and we're talking about uh, Energy 808, the cutting edge. Wow. And today uh, with Steve. Hi, Steve. Say hello, Steve. Hello, huh? Yeah. Former city council, former energies, energy person, knows a lot about energy, knows a lot about Huonua, which is the project in the Hamakua Coast there, uh, which uh, recently, I don't know if it's too early to say this, but it, it failed. It's gone. It's not happening. Um, so, Steve, can, let's try to educate people on, on what happened from an, an energy or a, I don't know if renewable energy is the right frame of, frame of mind, but a, an energy vantage uh, perspective on this. It's, it's been, gosh, it's been well over 12, maybe as close to 15 years as this thing has been cooking around in Hamakua. So what, what was it about and what happened to it? Let's begin at the beginning. So it really started back in 2008, and they uh, formed a, the group Huhonua, and then they sought an exemption or a waiver from the competitive bidding process before the Public Utilities Commission. And that should have been kind of a red flag right there. The commission had adopted a competitive bidding process in 2006, so about two years before. And here they were already uh, flashing a waiver um, for a project that was really quite expensive. Yes, okay, so that, that you begin with that, um, that it, it, it got a waiver, but for an expensive uh, elect electrical supply. Um, and um, a lot of investment though, too, because this was, uh, this was uh, what, biomass? What was this? What was the, the special sauce of this project? Yeah, it's all about trees, Jay. They wanted to uh, do something with all the trees they'd planted on the Hamakua coast after sugar went out of business, uh, about 30,000 acres. Uh, they attempted various uh, tree harvesting operations, shipping it to Japan and China. Those were unsuccessful. They just oh, didn't... I remember wood chips. Do you remember wood chips? Yeah. Wood chips out of uh, the harbor there. Um in Kauai High, Kauai High. Yeah. yeah, and then one day they had this stack, this, this, this huge pile of wood chips, it was probably 50 feet high, maybe 100, and it started burning by some kind of spontaneous combustion, and the whole thing burned up, and that was the end of the wood chips, but it showed you how many trees we have on the Hamakua coast. We have a, a huge supply of trees. Uh, do we need to, we need to harvest them? Was it necessary to do this? Uh, why, don't, why don't we just leave the trees in place? Isn't it better to, to have an environment with living trees? Yeah, just from an economic standpoint, you know, we're getting solar now at around eight cents a kilowatt hour with no fuel cost adjustment at all. This project wanted about 14 cents a kilowatt hour just for the fuel adjustment, plus another 22 cents a kilowatt hour for the base rate. So way overpriced so you know we need to find something else to do with trees than to try and make power out of it it's yeah I don't, you know nobody likes the idea of cutting trees down anyway but cutting them down and then burning them that's a, a further problem especially if you're trying to do um, you know carbon redu reduction of carbon emissions uh, but what's interesting is though that and perhaps it was a vision question did these guys see into the future? If you're in energy, don't you agree, Steve? You got to see into the future. You got to see where it's going. And I think they were maybe looking backward instead of looking forward. What's your thought about that? Well, there's been a lot of regulatory changes, as you know, Jay. The Ratepayer Protection Act has passed. Uh, they've adopted a new framework as a result before the PUC on how to judge projects and look at utility reform. Uh, during the same time period that they were coming in for this project, NextEra made a bid to take over Hawaiian Electric. So there's a lot of bad timing issues. And then it got tied up in litigation. At one point, they had 28 outstanding legal filings going on. Uh, they, they got into a bad uh, issue with the contractor that was building the project. They got into a labor dispute things really got ugly and it just dragged the process out. And the more years that went by, the less that this whole project made any sense at all. Well, speaking of lawsuits, um, 
And I did see the complaint that was filed by Huhonua uh, against, I guess, everybody in the on the block about Sherman Antitrust Act, which I, that was really a spectacularly long pleading. Um, and uh, what was it? <laughs> I was like, wow, who who paid for that? That that has to be one of the most expensive, you know, complaints I have seen. Uh, and it, it looked pretty sketchy, as a matter of fact, just reading it quickly. What about that Sherman Antitrust Act suit? Yeah, so the U.S. District Court would agree with your opinion, Jay, that it was pretty sketchy. They didn't buy the basic premise that this was somehow a conspiracy theory on the part of Hawaiian Electric and Nextera to push them out of the market so that they could come in with their own project. And, you know, they were finger pointing at Hawaiian uh, Hamakua Energy Partners, which got acquired about this time. Uh, that was an old naphtha plant. They've since uh, been converting it over to biodiesel. Um, so they kind of felt like the fix was on, or that's how they were trying to spin it in court. Uh, the court didn't really buy it, but after a long time, they agreed that Hawaiian Electric would actually support a, a renewed uh, waiver request and that they would come back in through the PUC. And the PUC granted it, only to have it challenged all the way up to the Hawaii Supreme Court where it lost. Yeah, well, that was uh, life of the land and, and Henry Curtis, wasn't it? He, he challenged it on environmental grounds a few years ago, uh, saying that uh, this would probably have a deleterious effect on the environment. What was the nature of his claim, do you call? So he won on two specific items. One was a clean and healthful environment which uh, mirrored a decision that Miko uh, had to deal with a uh, Sierra Club lawsuit on a similar type of issue where they were burning coal in the old sugar plant and they weren't looking at greenhouse gas emissions and uh, state law requires a greenhouse gas analysis. They didn't really do one for this project. They just made some vague statements about uh, being carbon neutral because it's trees, blah, blah, blah. And didn't really do a tr true analysis. And uh, so the Supreme Court basically tossed it out. And at that point- uh, They remanded it. They remanded it to yeah. the PUC. They, they wanted further proceedings uh, to e examine the environmental issue on yeah, emissions, so, I guess. Yeah. So the latest is that the PUC decided to toss the waiver. And so without the waiver from the competitive process, there's just no way that this project is ever gonna come back. And, and, be competitive that, you know, we're looking at solar now at eight cents a kilowatt hour. I mean, they just can't compete with it. It's just the market. Well, and then, then this, is, uh, you know, this is all intertwined. The Big Island is like a, a special three ring model. Um, this is all intertwined with the, with the uh, Pune Geothermal Venture, which, uh, which tells us that when they come back online, or maybe there's already a PPA here, I don't know. Uh, when they come back online, it's gonna be cheaper still, am I right? So the PPA for PGV is going through renegotiation, as you know. Uh, previously, it was pegged to the price of oil. So not much savings for ratepayers there, but now that it's being renegotiated without PURPA, the Public Utilities Regulatory Policy Act. So it's gonna come in at a much lower price tag, but that still has not become public. I've heard numbers, but those are not public numbers mm -hmm. at this point. In the meantime, they had both the eruption that surrounded the plant with lava flows, uh, destroyed the substation, uh, cut off the power lines, islanded the plant basically, and uh, it changed the resource. Uh, previously, when they were using their wells, it was a, a water-dominated resource, a brine-dominated resource. Uh, with a smaller fraction of steam, and now it's a steam-dominated resource, indicating that somehow the plumbing got changed at depth with the intrusion of magma underneath the power plant. And so they're, they're having to uh, move wells they previously used into a re-injection well category uh, under the UIC or Underground Injection Control Program through EPA. And then they're also looking to bring in, in totally new equipment in order to produce power as a result of resource changes. So yeah. it's real questionable whether or not they're gonna be able to drill new wells and actually meet objectives that they've laid out in their power purchase agreement. 
Why, from an economic point of view or an environmental one? No, no, just from a pure geology standpoint. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's real clear that with the changes underground, people tend to think of lava flows on the surface. But anybody who studied geology like I have uh, knows that most of the activity is going on underground. And even today, uh, lava is moving into the lower east rift zone. We're seeing what's called uh, inflation uh, in the area below Pu'u'o'o, but above where the power plant is. All of those things mean the ground is very dynamic, the resource is very dynamic. So uh, it's tough putting a power plant on the most active volcano in the United States in the most active rift zone of that, that volcano. So it's a, that's a quotable quote, Steve. Yeah. That, in fact, that's a that's a quotable quote that could have been, um, you know, a a, a, a basic truth uh, back in the '90s. Even you want to you want to put it on top of that, you know, you're going to have instability. You know that. Yeah. So they got lucky for a long time, and we avoided a lot of oil as a result. I mean, I don't hold that against them. I think that was a good thing. But going forward. We're looking, one of the categories that we're looking at is resilience. Well, what kind of resilience do you have when you're parking a big chunk of the power supply for the entire Big Island on, the, on this active volcano that's clearly showing, you know, it's, Haley's been doing a lot of dancing lately. And uh, I think it's going to cost them a fortune to get, oh, yeah. back, get back to uh, productivity. Um, and then they don't know if they'll be able to carry it forward. They don't know if it's resilient. And so what you have is a supply that may not be reliable. Yeah, that's right. And once again, with new competition coming into the marketplace, uh, what are called truly distributed energy resources, uh, an old central power plant like PGV uh, with large transmission and distribution costs, uh, some of the power lines go through albizia trees that are notorious for coming down in storms. Um, all of those things you need to take a good look at and, and balance in the energy scale, so to speak. It troubles me, though, because what I hear you saying, uh, you know, uh, interlinear is uh, it's all about solar. It's, it's all about solar. Uh, you know, when you, when you finish the, the trees in Huhonua, when you finish PGV, it's about solar. Now you can get a good price on solar uh, these days, especially with um, you know with storage. Is that it? Don't we have more? Can't we diversify? So when PGV went down, uh, the PUC moved ahead. Uh, Hawaiian Electric moved ahead with a competitive process, a phase one, and they went out to bids to replace PGV. And the solar projects, two 30 megawatt each with uh, four times that in terms of megawatt hours of battery storage, which is pretty significant, uh, got approved by the PUC. So those are happening. They'll be online within the next couple of years. Uh, solar goes in much faster than some of these other projects do just by their nature. Um, and they provide grid support, voltage support, a number of uh, load shifting, features that you don't get with a central power plant. Um, but the other alternative that's still quite viable is wind. And Parker Ranch did some wind studies along with Siemens, and these are grid quality studies, so very good studies. And NREL had already previously identified a world-class wind resource there between the mountain of Mauna Kea and Hualalai, or excuse me, not Hualalai, uh, Kohala Mountain. And on Parker Ranch properties, and uh, where the cows probably aren't going to mind a few windmills. And that resource alone could provide all of the power for the Big Island and more. So, even well, let's, let's review that. I mean, we had South Point. <laughs> South Point had uh, very early wind, a lot of turbines down there back in the, oh gosh, it must have been the 70s or the 80s, maybe. And, and they were abandoned and they were an eyesore. And everybody was ticked off that the developer never took them down or, you know, kept them going. And then there was, uh, what is it, the, uh, the, the ranch there, Kahala, in the Kahala Mountains, uh, at the top of the mountains, inside a, a kind of bowl. I remember seeing it. Uh, these have horseback riding up there. I rode, I rode horses <laughs> among those windmills. This is also maybe in the, uh, in the, in the 80s. 
Um, beautiful, beautiful location. You could not even see the windmills from outside because they were in the bowl. Okay, yeah. and um, I want to say Honua Ranch. There was a, there's another ranch that was yes, inside Kahua. the Parker Ranch. Kahua, 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 Kahua Ranch, right? Yeah, yeah. It was beautiful. Your good buddy Mitch Ewan has done a hydrogen project. <laughs> we got to talk to him about this. So you know, and that also was abandoned. I, I don't think that's functioning right now. No, um, both both the windmills or uh, wind uh, farms are working. Both uh, Talhuri took over the one in South Point. And they've uh, put in new machines now. Uh, they aren't quite as big as the new, new ones that are on the market today, but they're bigger than what was there before. And then uh, also Hawaiian Electric is moving ahead on a large standalone battery storage system, uh, about 12 megawatts that's gonna go in at Keaholi just above the airport there in Kona. Uh, so they can handle uh, the VARs, the variability of wind power that's on the grid by putting it into a large storage system. Mm -hmm. And Kahua is operating now? Yes. Now, what about the one right next to the Coast Guard there at Upolu? That's the one I'm talking about. I'm the, talking about near near the water. No, the one that's operating is up in Javi. It's between the town of Javi and the old Upolu Point Airport. Yeah, I'm, we're talking about the same thing. Yeah, right. yeah. <clears throat> well, that's that's encouraging to find out now. Is there public resistance? Because Lord knows uh, here in Oahu, there's plenty of resistance about wind, uh, which I I do not fully understand. In fact, I don't understand it at all, frankly. Um, but uh, what about the Big Island? Are people behind wind? So Parker Ranch uh, is a key part of the economy in Waimea Town, and um, they did a lot of PR work. They went out to the community and worked hard. And where they're proposing putting wind is well away from the town itself. Um, Kahuku, which used to be part of my council district on Oahu, the windmills are really, really close to the school, close to Kahuku town. Um, um, well, that's, that's Oahu. Oahu yeah. is all crowded. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a million people on a much smaller piece of land than the Big Island. So the Big Island's got room to put a project like that in where uh, the visual impacts are not going to be as significant as they are on the wall. So if you had to make um, you know, a completely ob objective, rational, cold-hearted choice between wind and solar, what would you choose? So my inclination on the Big Island is to start thinking about microgrids and not focus on just technology. Um, it's geographically diverse, as you know, Kau, which has the wind farm, has no other type of energy generation. And so if it gets cut off, then those electrons- yeah, But, but Kau has tons of solar, it's dry. The That's sun right. is always shining. Why, why not just put solar in there with batteries? Wouldn't that That's be a, a better choice for that location? Yeah, so they tried to put a solar project um in on some residential properties and it was a kind of a shady deal and it basically went nowhere it had a lot of community opposition but you're right as you get away from the mountain get away from Mauna Loa and get down further into the flatter areas you've got great sun down there so um you could put a microgrid together including battery storage wind and solar uh, that would meet those community needs. So I think the island should be thought of as a series of smaller microgrid projects. Mm, yeah, and maybe wind fits better in some places, some locations than others. You know, one of the things that troubles me about wind is the same thing you were mentioning about, about PGV. You could have a windstorm, extreme weather, call it climate change weather, right? And that wind blows a, what do you call it, a cupola on the top. Um, it blows the turbine right off the stand. Uh, which happened actually in uh, Upalakua a couple of years ago. It, 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 it knocked off uh, one of the one of the turbine devices, and um, I think you got to be careful of that, and, and you got to choose your location carefully so that you don't lose a multi-million dollar investment because uh, it wouldn't necessarily be just one turbine. It could be a whole field of turbines if the if the wind came down the plane, so to speak. Um, so uh, who's so what, what else is there in, in the Big Island? I guess that's it, wind and solar. That's the future, right? 
Well, at NELHA, they're still looking at uh, OTEC. Uh, my personal feeling is OTEC still very expensive. Uh, yeah, they've been looking at OTEC since 1912, I think. Yeah, and they've recently gotten some additional grant funds to put in a, another OTEC. They started out with mini OTEC, which was a floating barge system. I remember. Um, now, now they're putting in one that's land source. But the airport and Nelha are right next to each other. And the airport's moving ahead uh, under strong lead standards, and they're looking to retrofit, expand the airport, and make it more energy self-sufficient. So putting Nelha and the airport together as a microgrid project really could be very attractive. So why do you say microgrids are attractive at all? Is it because you don't want to spend the money for uh, cabling them all together? And, uh, it's because it gets expensive to cross the island crisscross with cables, and if you and, and not only that, but you degrade in the in in the electrical signal uh, over over long distances. It, yeah, but is, am I right about that? What what is the reason that you like a microgrid? Yeah, part of it is you really don't want those electrons to travel too far, or you start seeing a lot of loss. You're paying for electrons onto the grid but then you're losing their value the further away from the power generation you get. So breaking it into microgrids makes a lot of economic sense. Hmm. Uh, and we're looking at incentives now before the PUC to encourage microgrid development. So yeah, I, I, well, maybe that's a thing of the future, isn't it? As long as you have storage and so it's gonna be dependent on whatever kind of generation system you have, you have to have storage, especially. Look, look how well Kauai is doing KIUC using that approach on solar. But why, why are you interested in this, Steve? I mean, you have historically as a career, you know, you've had plenty of time and energy. Why now? Is it, is it a hobby or you want to run for office? What is it? <laughs> no, I've, I've uh, spent my time in public office. Thanks, Jay. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I, I'm the father of the Hawaii Energy Code. I uh, worked with Howard Wig, my good buddy. At sure, State we Energy know Howard very well. Yeah. And he was having no luck getting it through the state legislature. So when I, I got on the city council, I put my energy geek factor to work and I passed the first energy code for Honolulu. And it's been nice to see Howard uh, get it amended recently and upgraded. Yeah. And I continue to work on, on a volunteer basis, Jay, on energy projects. I've been working with uh, Governor Inslee, who's very pro climate change. Uh, some of the state facilities here could benefit from what's called energy saving performance contracts. Um, it's a third party financing mechanism where you can harvest savings out of state buildings, reduce costs, and create jobs in a pandemic uh, economy. So, and I've also been working with Hawaii County uh, to do the same thing. Um, they have an uh, an energy coordinator position with, within county R&D, um, and they're looking at doing a county-wide energy saving performance contract, much as Maui is doing now, and also Honolulu. Uh, Honolulu has a very aggressive one, Jay, that you should have somebody on your show talk about, because they're looking to convert all of the wastewater treatment plants on Oahu, which are big energy hogs, uh, converting them over to cogeneration and basically shutting those giant loads off of the grid. Uh, they're one of Hawaiian Electric's biggest customers. And so making those energy self-sufficient is gonna have a big impact yeah. to the grid towards 100% renewables That's faster. Great. There are so many issues, you know, that are statewide um, and um, so many possibilities. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of these possibilities like OTEC has, has been, they've been sort of clogged in the pipeline. Uh, as as offshore wind is clogged in the pipeline, um, but you know uh, I, it's nice to see that you're looking at this, and I and I hope we can uh, circle back and get you on our Wednesday show with Mitch Ewan and talk about you know everything really, especially the Big Island, which I consider more of a laboratory than any other island really. Um, but let me let me return back to the lessons of Hu Honua because I wanted to cover that with you. There are a number of lessons. And, and if you put yourself in the shoes of the developers of Honua, which is now pretty much Marque, um, you know, what, 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 what do they, what do we learn 
from that experience. My recollection is they spent 350 big ones on that uh, and their investors must be very sad about it. Um, and what, you know, <laughs> very, very sad about it. What, what can we learn from what, what happened? I suspect you're gonna see an awful lot of lawsuits. I know you're, you're a lawyer by background and uh, I, I don't think anybody would be terribly surprised if lawsuits start flying left and right. I've, I've been quite frankly, uh, very careful in what I say today in your program because I would like to keep out of, uh, out of the way of that type of a lawsuit. But uh, you know, they're, they're able to write off losses. Federal laws allow for a certain amount of these types of costs to be written off. Um, there's a single, my understanding was there was a wealthy woman who was involved in this project. So I, I don't know how much money she has, how much of an impact this is gonna have uh, on her personally. Um, but to move ahead and spend a whole lot of money, Jay, without having a power purchase agreement in your back pocket, seems like a pretty risky venture to me. That's just my personal view. Mm -hmm. But uh, the solar projects, for instance, that have been approved by the PUC most recently and are, are moving ahead, they, they're they waiting until that power purchase agreement is approved by the PUC before they move ahead mm. on construction. I think that's a wise approach for anybody in the energy business is to you know, have full disclosure about what your costs are gonna be, let the PUC decide. Uh, do all of the permitting that you need to do, get your environmental assessments out of the way, bird studies, bat studies, all of those types of issues that are out there. Uh, so expect to spend some money, uh, do some time on those types of things. But it is a good market to move into you know, because of our avoided costs being so high in Hawaii. Well, is it a good time now? Um, you know, I, I wonder, we're in COVID, the economy is in the tank. Um, I think, uh, you know, a lot of observers would say it's going to stay in the tank for a while, months, years, who knows what. One, one said, don't expect to, to recover an economy in the state until 2028. Uh, whether, whether that person is right or not is an open question. Nobody, nobody really knows. But query, is it worthwhile now starting a big or even a middle-sized uh, energy project now renewable and doing the right priorities, which they didn't do in Huhonua. Um, but is, it, is, this, is this a good time or is this a good time to wait? No, I, I think the fact that they've already gone out with phase two and uh, the other two projects are twice the size of the phase one project. So they're 60 megawatts each. So we're looking at a total of 180 megawatts plus 700 and I'll let you do the math, 700 and some megawatt hours of battery storage. So they got a good response. I think investors are looking for a safe place to invest right now. Uh, this, this solar tax credits are still available, uh, depending on how the outcome of the election is. Uh, Joe Biden, for instance, has got a very uh, vigorous climate uh, portion in his campaign, if he can get support from a Senate and a House to get it passed. Uh, I think it could be an exciting time. And because a power purchase agreement is a form of third party financing, Jay, and it can take advantage of historically low interest rates that are available today, money is just really cheap. Now is a good time to do infrastructure. So I'm actually encouraged, and I think solar prices have dropped recently. Uh, so I think that's another encouraging sign in the market. Both solar and battery prices continue mm. to drop. Yeah, and the other thing is that you build stuff and that means jobs for people. Yeah. A lot of people are, you know, getting jobs and getting paid. It helps uh, even when there wouldn't otherwise be um, an economy. So uh, we only have, in fact, we're out of time. But let me ask you one last question. I, I really appreciate your thoughts on this. As well, you know, the public. The public um, is so fickle, honestly, and they're fickle with energy. Sometimes they love it, sometimes they hate it. If it's in their backyard, they truly hate it. Um, and and they don't, I think a lot of people don't realize that in the end, we are going to have to have renewables. It's not just a theoretical target. To be resilient in this state, we have to have renewables. But I wonder if you could take a minute and just tell the public what you would like them to know, what you would like them to think about the subject of develop, developing energy in Hawaii? 
Yeah, it's really a pocketbook issue. The more we're stuck on imported oil, the sooner we get off it, the more we start seeing savings. We're literally sending billions of dollars out of our Hawaii economy every year in order to pay for oil, imported oil. And that has a, a multiplier effect in our economy. And so the faster we get off of oil, the better. And so we want to see rates go down because those rates have an impact on everything we buy as consumers. When we go in the Walmart store and they have freezers and we're buying frozen peas out of that freezer, we're paying an energy cost that's embedded in everything that we buy in the economy. And so when those costs go down, that benefits all of us as consumers and it affects all businesses as well. It's a big cost for them. And so we need to make that transformation happen sooner than later. Uh, there's every indication that the Big Island could get to 100% renewables by 2030, 15 years ahead of the state mandate for 100% renewables. And I, I think given that the high costs of energy on the Big Island, uh, the sooner we get there, the better. So I, I would encourage people to take that bigger view, as you say. But it is important always to keep in mind uh, community opposition and to try and work with communities. In Waikoloa, for instance, the Waikoloa Village Association owns the land where one of these solar projects is going. So they're getting lease rent monies. So this is a huge boon to them. If they need money to uh, pay their interior roads or uh, provide improvements to their clubhouse or whatever they need, uh, wind is going to be able to provide that without having to see their monthly maintenance fees go up. And so there's those types of benefits. So anytime you uh, make the pitch for the project, you've got to find a way to get buy-in from people. Uh, I, I did a wastewater treatment plant project in Honolulu. And at the end of this presentation where we talked about this energy performance contract and the millions of dollars that we're going to save taxpayers, the very bored employees looked at me and said, well, what do we get out of this? <laughs> <laughs> and, and That's the problem, isn't it? <laughs> so then I, I talked about how we were going to be able to replace this aging air conditioning system and uh, air condition some additional areas in their workspace and suddenly everybody got all excited and the whole room and the <laughs> attitude changed so you've got to be a good salesman jay you really have to find people where they are and reach out and touch them in that spot and yeah. uh, to make things happen but if, for, we, for my friends who are environmentalists and they're complaining about an offshore wind project and those little blinky lights 14 miles off the coast I have little sympathy for that. <laughs> you know, as environmentalists, we can't say that we want this as part of our future and promote it. And then the first time a project actually comes along, we complain about those blinky <laughs> LED lights on 14 miles off the coast. That just doesn't wash. So the, people have to find some middle ground there. <laughs> Yeah, it's very important to the state. Well, Steve, it's great having you on the program. Really, uh, this has been very uh, helpful and educational. And I do want to circle back with you for more. Thank you so much, Steve Holmes. It's an honor, Jay. Take care. Aloha. Take care. Aloha.